our next session is a discussion about HPC and clouds. Are we ready to proceed with that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I can go ahead and uh, present the slides we have, which are just uh, some some questions and things like that that we came up with uh, to sort of kick off some some discussion here. I'm trying to share this window. I think that'll be sufficient. Um, I assume folks can see that. I'm going to assume yes. Um, yeah. You're, yeah. you're good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we just came up with sort of a, a list of, of, of items for, for HPC and cloud. Um, and we just put a number of, of these questions here in this in this doc to sort of kick off some of this discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll just go through them uh, briefly here. Um, but since this is kind of a, a you know, a, a joint Atlas CMS, you know, LHC, uh, discussion, um, we wanted to ask, you know, first and foremost, what is it that, that Atlas and CMS can do together uh, in the HPC space and, and in the cloud space? Um, you know, we've done a lot of work with, uh, you know, evaluating uh, cloud resources. We've certainly done a lot of work with the HPCs and, and running various kinds of workloads there. Um, and, and a lot of this is to, you know, Try to explore, you know, how do we, you know, fully bring these sorts of uh, facilities into, uh, you know, in, into the fold and make all the accounting work correctly and, and all of that stuff. Um, and another question, you know, is, is, you know, are there are there any unique capabilities provided by HPCs or cloud uh, that we aren't taking advantage of currently, but could be? Um, one thought was, you know, does it make sense to tie clouds or HPCs uh, in with our analysis facilities in some way? Um, you know, because CMS and Atlas are both, you know, sort of putting these things together, and you know, maybe this end user analysis area, uh, you know, makes sense um, to to tie, you know. For example, tie clouds into analysis facilities where you can have these hybrid facilities. You know, maybe we can do things like get GPUs on demand, um, that sort of thing. Um, and and to that extent, you know, is there anything that we can do with the the HPCs that are that are traditionally uh, for some time now uh, really H or GPU heavy? Um, and you know, is there is there anything that we can do with, for example, people doing machine learning? Um, can we tie those in, in, in with these HPCs in some way? Um, another interesting topic that came up a lot this week uh, was uh, this green cloud computing. Um, you know, companies like like Lancium, uh, have they changed the the landscape at all for um, for cloud cycles? Um, you know, I know we've we've done a lot of studies to to try to determine you know if if it's cheaper to do things on the cloud, or are we still very cost competitive in our traditional facilities? Um, does does Lancium change that equation at all? Um, you know, can we get any benefit from from these uh, these cheaper cloud cycles? Um, on the other page here, we have um, you know you know if if and when we can we can integrate HPC and cloud into pledges. Uh, what's the right resource mix, assuming we, we have a choice? Um, lots of interesting stuff we could explore there. Um, you know, and overall, you know, what, what experience do we have today? You know, what experience do we need to, to gain yet? Um, you know, what are our advantages and risks uh, for, for things like commercial clouds and, and, and HPC to some extent? Um, and and what, is the, what is the timeline for these sorts of things? So yeah, um, with all that, I'm happy to open it up to anybody who wants to to comment. Hey Lincoln, yes. I don't know if you can see my hand. Yes, I can. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just started looking at that window. Go ahead. Uh, all, all, all good questions. So let's go back to slide two. Sure. So two comments here, of course. One is that, uh, uh, does it make sense to try to extend our analysis facilities with clouds? I mean, that's, uh, or HPCs, I mean, that's uh, 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 perhaps should be a little bit broader. 
I mean, Atlas for a whole year now has been uh, 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 providing access to uh, analyzers to both the Google Cloud and Amazon Cloud. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, the cloud scan are very competent analysis facilities. I think to limit ourselves that, uh, to hybrid facilities or extending facilities mm -hmm. is, is uh, 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 perhaps too constraining. I mean, I, I don't really sure. see why we need to have uh, clouds and grid-based grid facilities be uh, uh, extensions of each other or, or in any ways, uh, you know, uh, 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 be hybrid. I mean, one can easily envision, I mean, people are doing ML uh, in clouds and have been doing ML in clouds for, for a while now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, if you look at models like uh, the model in Rubin and so on and so forth, they just use clouds uh, for certain things and um, uh, they will use grids for certain things. So, so I think we need to think more broadly than just extending our hybrid. So that, mm -hmm. that was the one comment I wanted to make. Sure. Yeah. Paul Heckman, may I have comment to comment? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Because uh, when, when uh, we compiled the list, uh, I believe here it's more question that uh, for uh, decades, uh, our analysis was transparent. You can run it on any side. So if you have more than one uh, hybrid model of uh, a grid plus HPC plus cloud, uh, how will guarantee that you can run your analysis transparently? And uh, for instance, uh, you mentioned Google and Amazon. Yeah, so you run it on Google and Amazon, but then uh, you need this transparency and integration with our software stack, how you access data, how you access uh, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe it is more about this hybrid than uh, is it GPU, CPU, or TensorFlow, or whatever. Um, I see that, that Wei and, and Andy both have their hands up. Uh, let's go ahead with Wei. So I probably uh, just uh, comment on what Kaushik said about Rubens and their success in the, in the cloud. Uh, yeah, Rubin especially was probably, if you look at what they're doing, uh, they are particularly uh, spending a lot of efforts in the cloud for the, for the analysis. So what they do is that they create what they call a science platform, which is basically a full software stack that you can easily spin up uh, analysis in uh, analysis sort of a facility type of things in the cloud. Well, they don't always do that, but uh, there is already 15 of them. Uh, but there is also a key difference is that uh, maybe it's a reference value for us. Ruben, basically says that if you want to spin this thing up, this is the software and you pay for what you are doing. And this is a model that probably different from us. So maybe this is something we want to think of whether this, I think it's something that make the uh, uh, use, usage of cloud in, for Ruby possible. So maybe it's something that we has a reference value to us. Thanks, Wei. Uh, Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out another aspect, and it leads with uh, Alexi was talking about. Uh, it's great to have all of these wonderful technologies that people can use. Uh, what people actually do want is a place that they can go to one place, not a hundred places, when they run into problems or when they have uh, questions like, how do I get started? Or where is the data? that I need to do this with. And I can see over time where analysis facilities, if we move strictly to cloud, let's say, the analysis facilities will become the point of contact uh, to basically uh, allow people to easily use all of these resources that are out there. So we can't lose sight of that. There's the human factor uh, that we really have to consider on how to get people started and keep them going. That's a great point. Thanks, uh, Dirk. Yeah, I just wanted to um, 
it's a, it's it's a little bit of a response to the last two comments because and and that that gets us to what we have on the next slide, which is the resource mix. Because if you can you can build whatever you want technically, you can build put up an, an analysis facility in, in the cloud, and it's great and it's the way forward, like the similar to what, what Ruben did, it, and it's all very nice. But then, is that really what we want to? Do we want to pay for the next 10 years for that? And that's our way forward. So we have to think about a little bit. Yes, you can build it, but do you want to pay and maintain it forever that way? Is, is that the way forward? So that's, uh, I just want to throw a little bit of caution in there uh, to, to think a little bit about what the long term goal is in terms of, of, of resource mix and, and what we want to run where. Yeah, definitely, and and maybe some of these enabling technologies, you know, the, the, the Kubernetes or whatever of the world, will will have some some common interfaces that you know maybe if the if the vendors get too expensive, we can we can slide things yeah, off. Yeah, we, we need. Yeah, um, exactly. But it, it did it did seem like from the from the um, the presentation yesterday uh, that uh, that there is still some amount of uh, of vendor specificity uh, when it comes to those. Uh, you know, even if they're doing a Kubernetes thing or whatever, right? There's, there's still the, the, the special sauce on those vendors. And so there's still some retool cost. Um, okay, uh, Alexei? Yeah, uh, I uh, think that uh, when in Atlas we are discussing with uh, commercial clouds to address uh, gear concern. So we never say that uh, any company will have ticket for 10 years. So, and uh, with transparency, which uh, uh, we are talking about, at least in Atlas, it means that you can use any commercial clouds. So you don't need to tune your uh, software stack each time when you go from one vendor to another. So it should be absolutely transparent. And back uh, a bit for HPC. So I think we have now very interesting experience with Euro HPC, especially with the case that with uh, Euro HPC, you have disk space, not negligible, it's a level of petabyte. And this make it possible to run analysis workflow. I'm not sure we have the same in general in uh, US for the moment. And this, uh, I, I would say this a bit limited us to consider uh, US HPCs for analysis. Uh, Andy, I see, I see your hand is up still. Or did you have another comment or question? No, I just forgot to. Okay, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. Um, D Dave Dykstra asked in the chat, uh, have any of the commercial cloud facilities been used uh, when they need to be paid for uh, and not just with grants from, from the cloud companies? Is yes, anybody... in Atlas, we've been doing it for a couple of years. But, but again, so it is a very interesting uh, point here because uh, this, uh, at least Google, they came with a new model, which is called subscription model. And uh, uh, you don't pay for your facilities, uh, for your peak facilities, but you can double or even triple uh, amount of CPUs uh, when you need them. So it, it is something what happened, Kaush can correct me, something what happened maybe one year and a half ago. Right, so uh, I mean, we, we have moved on to a new kind of cloud uh, payment model. We don't, it's no longer, you know, what it was 10 years ago where we were paying with uh, purchase orders or credit cards for, for cloud credit. Now it's like an unlimited use model where we pay a subscription, very similar to what uh, happens with Gmail and G Drive and all the other things that people are very much used to. Um, and in the subscription model, uh, you pay a subscription and then you have uh, use of cloud resources. It, it's very interesting. So with the subscription model, do they do they have some abstraction for differentiating between like storage and compute and all that stuff or is it? Nope. Uh, I mean, basically the whole menu, except for some of the off, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, offerings that you get uh, a la carte from other vendors, uh, everything else is, is, is available. 
How long have you had that subscription? Do you have any long-term experience about renegotiating? And do they start? Do they look at usage and then determine future price? I, I mean, they're in the business of making money, so I don't. Right. <laughs> yeah. Very good question. It seems like their price list keeps going down. Oh, okay. Have you had limits in, uh, limits in the subscription? Meaning, you know. Needed. There's a big clause. There's a there's a clause in the subscription which says that if you abuse it, so of course the price of the subscription is based on what we tell them what we are planning to use. If you abuse it, like use five times as much, they may restrict it. Never happened so far, but the, the clause is there. It's called an abuse clause. So you can't say that you're gonna, you know, use. 10,000 CPUs for the whole year uh, BC, and then uh, turn all the Atlas workload of 400,000 CPUs onto Google the minute the subscription starts. They will stop you, I, I think. So could you estimate your cost savings on the subscription model rather than paying like, per instance? Is it like half as much, 75%? Uh, one of the goals is to come up with the, you know, what is the real cost that, that I don't think we are at a stage that's part of the R&D goals at a stage to say, we definitely natively know exactly what the total cost is, but we certainly know what the subscription cost is. So, so are these subscription type of things, are these comparable across cloud vendors? Like, is it, is it to where you can do some kind of competitive bidding or, or anything like that? Uh, let me chime in here because I had my hand raised. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Google has been uh, particularly aggressive in coming up with these models, uh, which is amazing, actually, when you think about it, uh, because I don't know what is driving them to do this, but they're really aggressive of coming up with something you can afford. Uh, but that leads to some complications in terms of how the model works. Uh, case in point, for instance, egress charges, uh, which every vendor has, uh, and Google is using a model of offsets against that, where you get free egress to a certain limit, and then you can offset the charge with basically using some other resource in their cloud to offset the egress charge, uh, which is very complicated when you think about it, uh, and it's very hard to predict how much in the end it'll cost you. Uh, but Remember, this is brand new. Vendors are starting to do this, and uh, the the whole landscape is changing by the week in terms of you know who's offering what and and how much is it going to cost you and how cost effective is it. But in some sense, it's an exciting time, right? In in the terms of uh, where the public cloud sits in relationship to research. Uh, uh, if I may comment, uh, Andy, for what you said, so uh, you are right uh, for certain cases and for certain cases not. Uh, it very much depends, uh, and I think we spent uh, you know, a lot of time to discussing it, uh, but uh, just to summarize. So you can have egress cost for zero for the whole period of your subscription model. So. I also want to mention that a model which we are discussing for Atlas is very different from Vera Rubin model because uh, they have centralized facilities and it is not facilities for end users. It is facilities like uh, tier zero in some extent. So uh, what we are trying, it is uh, very different. We, we, what I agree with, uh, what I believe Dirk said, that we should be very careful. Uh, I also want to, as far as I'm talking, answer to Brian. Brian, uh, to your question in the chat, in Atlas, we have all possible combinations. We have on the grid uh, analysis tasks, which last 30 minutes, which is really analysis. And we have analysis tasks, which lasted for uh, 100 hours. Yeah, which is definitely uh, not end user analysis, but uh, uh, definition is it is submitted by end users. It is submitted by physicists and it is not uh, centralized or physics group production. And that's why I, I was getting at is 
you, you know, it, particularly if we want to mention analysis facilities or, or use cases or, or whatever, we I don't think we necessarily benefit from lumping them all into the same thing. It's so, so take for example the the work that Atlas is doing with uh, Google Big Table. Uh, that that's remarkably different than using Google to launch VMs to to do private Monte Carlo for a user, right? It, you know, I I think all the the, the questions about costs are a, a little misguided or, or besides the point because you you miss the diversity of, of services that we, we honestly can't replicate uh, that the clouds might offer. You know, if, it, if it's all about pennies and, you know, per, per core hour, then, then why, why don't we just let the accountants do that work and <laughs> tell us if it's, it's cheaper to put a CPU in Amazon or, or at, uh, at the Fermi lab. I, I think the really interesting things here are what are the sort of things we can't do regardless of the costs? And I think implementing something like Google Big Table, I have a question of. This is another possibility and this is another thing which we are uh, trying, but uh, to your previous comment. So uh, we have uh, in Atlas 1,550, I, I checked today, individual users who submitted their uh, tasks. So that's why whatever you will have uh, as analysis facilities, you always have combination of users which will use them for their I don't know, private Monte Carlo or whatever, or private derivation production. And we, we know it, it, it happens in all experiments. Uh, concerning uh, the second part of what you said, it is very interesting because one of the things which we are trying is this big query, which is not available, big query tables, which are not available, but available by Google and use them for uh, end user analysis. And we have a group of people who are trying it in Atlas. Guys, uh, let's let's let Fred jump in. He's had his hand up for a while. Yeah, I just want to tell an apocryphal story. I, something that happened at IU. IU had its had its cloud storage with the Box Company, and we were given a very good price with unlimited storage. And of course, as anybody who offers unlimited anything finds out in technology. Unlimited can be a lot. And um, so when the contract came up for renewal, Box changed the price by 10 times. So a crash course was, uh, was, uh, in, was under the, that was done. And the data was moved to, uh, to Google Drive and to, one, and to Microsoft OneDrive. Um, most of the users went to OneDrive, but all of the big users went to Google Drive. Uh, that, so 40% of the data went to Google Drive. 110,000 users went to OneDrive and like 20,000 or something went to Google Drive. Uh, then two weeks ago, Google said if any, any, that they were gonna charge extra for any user using more than five gigabytes of data, which is basically all of them because they were the big users. <laughs> and um, so I just want to really warn against vendor lock-in. You know, Google may be giving it to you for free today and they may have functionalities that, as Brian says, you can't get elsewhere, but they also may come back to you and ask for a ton a ton of more, a ton more money once you're locked in. And if you think about it, you're in the middle of a run, it's coming up on Moriand, and all of a sudden Google says, well, if you want to do your analysis for Moriand, it's going to cost you a factor of five more. What do you do? This is, I mean, I'm not saying that I have an answer to Brian's point where you can do stuff on Google that you can't do elsewhere. That's true. but you better play a little bit of CYA. And I, I'm going to shut up now, but this is, this is just my, my experience. Yeah, that's a great point, Fred. It seems like with, with unique capability comes unique risk. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's, that's why I was, I was trying to bump us off just thinking about costs, because what, what, you know, yeah, there's, sure. there's the totality of things. You know, and, and yes, unique is good, and unique can also mean locking. 
we shouldn't only look at these things. I mean, if if we were only going to do things by uh, cost savings, we would close down half the universities because you could double the number of people per university and get cost savings. Yes, Brian, but we're living with a flat, flat budget. And if Google exceeds that, what do we do? It, it seems like in general, the, the, the cloud providers, I mean, you know, Google has big table or whatever, you know, uh, I'm sure Microsoft and Amazon have some equivalent type of services. And maybe we can think in terms of, you know, what are those, what are those general services that the clouds can, can hyperscale or, or whatever? Um, and can we take advantage of any of those things? Just, you know, keep, keeping one eye on, uh, you know, if, if there, if, if the price does jump, 10 times tomorrow, uh, you know, can, what would it take to shift over to, you know, another provider service, that sort of thing. Uh, Rob, do you have a hand raised? Yeah. yeah, I was wondering um, about maybe uh, going off here in a little bit different direction, which is, um, you know, in, in Atlas, uh, okay, so um, we're developing analysis capabilities there, which, yeah, some of them might be, um, in, you know, might require Google intrinsic services. Others are just other items of infrastructure brought together with uh, Kubernetes. And that was also a, a theme uh, from the Ruben speaker was that uh, they were, you know, highly leveraging GKE for their pipelines in setting this up. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, to the extent that we use some level of lingua franca here between our, you know, as we set infrastructures up between cloud and analysis facilities on prem, for example, uh, that that would be a, a good, a, you know, a good feature to have in terms of, uh, you know, maintaining or, you know, not getting locked in on a specific provider or, um, or you know, being able to take the capability that, you know, is, is nicely done in cloud and, you know, easily brought together and then uh, being able to reproduce that where you might have resources that you have, you know, direct control over for longer periods of time. Just want to add that as an item to consider here going forward. Yeah, indeed. And, and, and certainly that you know, any anything that we do, and this is sort of beyond the scope of this discussion, but anything we do should have a <laughs> very nice user interface so the users don't have to get uh, shuffled along to, to different things. It would be really nice if they had just a single way to, to log in or, or whatever, if it's if it's end user facing. Um, there was some discussion in chat here. Uh, anything anybody wanted to raise the rest of the group? It was just there is an egress this uh, comment in the in that I was just thinking when the when the egress comment was made, Lancium, I mean for now, that's that's always the thing because you never know how the pricing model will evolve. But for now, they don't have egress charges. That's a big argument for I mean it's not just the cheap uh, compute cycles, is they don't have yeah. egress charges whatsoever. Um, yeah, in the box case at IU. Uh, while they didn't have an egress charge, they did have an egress limit, and you had sort of petabytes of data in lots of teeny tiny files. And we they hired a professional company that does this sort of transition from cloud to cloud for comp other for mostly for for profit companies, but we barely made it because you just couldn't take enough data out per day. Even I guess we could have offered to pay more, but you know. It was the egress charges made it a really painful thing. We they basically had to start transferring data before they were ready because you'd never make it otherwise. And uh, that, that I mean, that somebody made a comment later. The pricing changes weekly, and they always come up with new stuff. And then it's it's an exciting time. And I was thinking, well, balancing on the edge of a cliff is also exciting. But and it's it's great if you develop and try out new things. It's just looking forward where you want to have a stable operational model and you want to integrate like you want to integrate cloud into your what you do your base the basis you need to support and you need to support going forward it's it's difficult to come up with a plan then if everything changes all the time so so that's that's one concern i have here amen brother dirk <laughs> great 
Thanks. Great, great comments, guys. Um, so, you know, is there is there anything that needs, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about you know, pledges and resource mixes, um, you know, is anybody? How about edge services? Sure. What I, what I mean is one of the things that came, it seems to be coming up as a common theme for cloud vendors or anything is just, and it's true in the HPC world, right? Each device is different and we don't seem to have a common Atlas CMS stuff for data going in and out of these clusters, whether they be cloud or uh, HPC. And that hurts when you have to go to a new place. I mean, I think one of the successes of the HPC in Europe is that someone who is, uh, is very knowledgeable at uh, HEP computing was in on the machine design level. And that makes a big difference. Yeah, it is, it is certainly painful that, you know, that these, these machines are designed with the, you know, the, the networking capabilities that are, that are such that, you know, they, they, they sort of clearly delineated between, you know, there, there are one transfers over here and you do that on this DTN and that's, that's the only way you, you communicate to this HPC. Um, what, can, can you, uh, expound upon that a little more, Doug. Like, are are you thinking anything? Like for it, I, I'll, in job yes. space, Atlas mm -hmm. has one solution for HPC. CMS has another. Yeah. For data space, we seem to be going our own way too. If I just take the same common HPC that we both use a lot, we deal with it differently fundamentally differently. So that essentially means that there is a uh, somewhat, you, you might argue a duplication of effort. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the different ways of using those, those endpoints as well are not uh, perhaps the, the most efficient, right? If we, if, we, if we came to those HPC sites together and said, you know, for, for Atlas and CMS, we need to, we need to have this way of, of getting data out, that, you know, maybe we would get some traction that way. I don't know. But also that the data centers agree that our, I mean, one of the bigger challenges is our authentication and privilege scheme isn't theirs. All right. Yeah, I was just gonna ask Doug, I mean, isn't, Rusio, you know, given that uh, CMS and Atlas have both um, signed on to using Rusio as their data placement management technology, it, would that be a place to maybe um, find that commonality or? So, yeah, I think so. But for instance, how do you, how, how do we get the HP, like Nurse, for instance, to set up RSEs on their DTN such that we don't have to necessarily do it ourselves because they own the problem. It's a service they provide. So this is a problem that we already discussed with NERSC and they, they are not willing to because the, the problem here is to access the uh, host certificate for a specific, by a specific experiment. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are a number of um, technical obstacles um, and other kinds of, of uh, you know, challenges here. Um, but I, I, I do agree that, um, you know, till now we have not attempted any sort of collaboration with regards to HPC access and utilization, right? And I mean, it, and I, I think the, the question here coming back to Dirk and Lincoln, uh, and, and everyone, Alexia, you know, going forward, um, you know, we already, you know, we have been told to consider this more directly and to look at, you know, a timeline for understanding what, you know, what the, you know, what the roadmap is for, you know, for the um, USLC program. 
for both these areas. Um, and it's a obviously a very you know diverse set of questions, right, and possibilities. But um, I think that I think on the slide on the on on, the, on one of the slides was uh, something about timeline or next steps. Do, are you guys? I know that's very early days, but do you have? in mind how we can come back to this and, uh, you know, make progress. Well, you know, one, one, one solution is always more meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think that we're trying to figure out some of that stuff now. Um, if, if I could change topics really quickly, I was just informed that Eric uh, has some slides to show for um, cloud bursting uh, and, and stuff from uh, Purdue. Um, Eric, can you, yeah, can thanks. you share? Yeah, let me give it a try. Yeah, thanks everybody. I just wanted to share some of our recent experiences at, at Purdue with uh, doing some benchmarking and, and bursting in, uh, in Azure. So since this is a, uh, an HPC session, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to say that the new exceed capacity resource that we just built at Purdue called Anvil is open for business. Um, there's some of the specs there. Um, uh, new Milan uh, processors and GPU nodes with four A100s. There's a Kubernetes piece. And during the early user uh, program, it was validated by CMS and OSG. And this is now available via the exceed allocation process. Um, so the I think submissions are open for that now, and they're due April 15th for allocations that would start uh, in July. So as part of Anvil, we had some, some cloud initiatives um, to kind of integrate cloud pathways into the Purdue cyber infrastructure. And a couple of these that I wanna focus on are benchmarking um, which is where we got access to AMD Milan nodes in Azure before they were available to the public. And then uh, also batch system bursting. And we'll take a look at that in the, the context of analysis facilities. So can we apply those, those two things that we're doing for Anvil to the, the tier two site at Purdue? Just a quick uh, uh, overview of the cloud bursting architecture. So we built images in Azure uh, that's, it's basically a Purdue worker node stack and the, you get the same environment that you would have at Purdue. We have a private subnet in Azure using a VPN to connect back to the campus networks and you get stuff like home and apps. And then we do Slurm bursting that's configured via uh, Slurm elastic computing. So in the context of our analysis facility, um, this is sort of what it would look like. Um, you would launch a notebook in Swan, which we're deploying in um, our local Kubernetes that we have. Uh, launch a notebook that could then interact with the community clusters, which would be tied to these cloud providers. So the first one that we were that we've integrated now is, is is Azure. So spin up a notebook, interact with the HPC systems on campus, and then you know scale out to the cloud if necessary. You can sort of take a look at this in, in action. So this is on a, a test cluster that we have at Purdue called, called Mac. Um, so here I've got a notebook up. Um, we're submitting to this Mac burst queue that has a combination of on-prem nodes and, and Azure nodes. So we bring up the cluster. We can see that in Slurm, these things get uh, scheduled. You can kind of see the the difference between on-prem and the cloud here is, you know, A are these on-premise nodes, and then Z is the stuff that we deployed in the cloud. And then once you set that up, you can, uh, you know, you can do your physics. Um, so we have a little scaling study going here of this uh, columnar-based analysis, the HMUMU, um, that uh, some results from this were published, uh, I think, last year. So this is ongoing uh, on-prem versus cloud versus hybrid to kind of see what, uh, what scaling looks like in those scenarios. So that's the cloud piece. Um, the, the second part is benchmarking. And, you know, benchmarking in CMS, 
is at least kind of hard because we have our own benchmarks, right? We can't just rely on the spec uh, 2017 uh, LINPAC, HPCG, the stuff that's uh, published by the vendors when they release a new uh, architecture. So maybe we can reach out to the, the cloud and, and see if we can benchmark these nodes before, um, before they become available to us to get an idea of, of if we're spending our money effectively or not. So Azure now has these Milan X uh, uh, CPUs from, from AMD. The difference between Milan and Milan X is you get, um, there's like a 3X increase in the uh, L3 cache. Um, so does that, does that help us or does it not help us? Um, so we did a little benchmarking study with all these processors um, on-prem and then uh, in the cloud. So some things to note here, the, the amount of cores are smaller on the cloud nodes. That's because they reserve some for the, the hypervisor. The power of these Milan X nodes is lower than it would be if you've got one, uh, you know, if you ordered one. These are in a special uh, preview, um, preview instances that um, wouldn't be the same as what Azure would have um, later. And it, it would be more powerful in that case and also if you had one of these on site. So I think the, the megahertz on those production nodes is like 2200. So we did a little, uh, did a little benchmarking study. Um, what I'm going to show you, the on-prem results have been scaled down with a core scaling factor. And then the improvement scores all use Rome as a baseline. So what sort of improvement am I getting? Um, for each benchmark um, and then on each processor. So I'll say that the Milan nodes here, these are the Milan nodes that are in Anvil. Anvil is, uh, you know, it's water-cooled. And so when we're talking Anvil with boost on, um, it's actually getting all the way up to that, uh, you know, 3.5 gigahertz range for the majority of the run. So for benchmarking, I started out with DB12, um, you know, the quick Dirac benchmark. And you can kind of see a, a trend here where, yeah, the Milan is better than Rome. Milan X, you may see some benefit from that L3 cache there. But then on-prem, and especially on-prem with boost, you get, you know, you get the most improvement. And you can probably reason out this. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, but now I'm going to switch the slide to the HSO6 benchmark, which um, it's kind of been the standard for a long time now, maybe, maybe, maybe too long, where we see, uh, you know, Milan on-prem is better than Rome. The Milan nodes in Azure um, are, are above that. And this Milan X, uh, I guess HSO6 really likes that extra, uh, you know, memory performance because it even outperformed the, uh, you know, the Milan on site that had, that had the boost. So that's interesting. So my third, uh, my, my third slide here is the HEP score, which is the new benchmark. And here, um, yeah, so we see there's actually very little improvement even between Rome and Milan on-prem and in the cloud. And then finally we get, we get a, a decent bump from Milan when we're doing that, uh, that boost of almost an additional gigahertz. So um, what are the conclusions here? So bursting uh, was relatively straightforward from an end user's pers perspective. Once it's integrated into Slurm, it sort of just worked for us. Um, can you use Azure to benchmark these things? Yeah, it was super easy. Um, you could use other cloud providers too. Um, and can we understand the results of the benchmarks? And I don't know if this needs to devolve into a benchmarking discussion, but you know the, the results aren't that consistent. Um, maybe it takes a, a discussion with, with some experts to see uh, how actionable that stuff is. And uh, you know, take a look at you know, today, which benchmark do we trust? I think we still report uh, site capacity in HSO6. Um, I'm not sure if we'll switch if there's a plan to switch to the HEP score for that or not. But um, yeah, that's what I've got. Um, some of our cloud efforts at, at, at Purdue, um, 
So thanks to the, the cloud people here, Sam and Zoe, who, um, who set this up, and then Stefan and Dimitri with our CMS use cases for the analysis facility. So yeah, I know we're a little over time and it's lunchtime, but um, if anybody has questions, I'll feel free. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, any quick questions before we break? And thanks everyone for sticking around. Yep, thanks everybody. Uh, Sean? Just a quick comment that that would be great to submit that to the next topics meeting, right, to talk on this, because that's where the benchmarking is being discussed and developed. Okay. Thanks. Anything from anyone else? Okay, so why don't we wrap up uh, this first session now?